It was a miserable winter day in mid-Ohio. A strong wind was blowing snow and sleet from the northwest, and I was coming down with the flu. I'm a carpenter, and we were working to frame up a house out on a windswept rise. I had been working a lot of overtime lately, trying to get some money ahead to take our kids to Panama City, Florida, over spring break. Money was always tight with us, since we bought the big new house a couple of years ago that my wife had to have. I was looking forward to ogling the college coeds on the beach as part of family R and R down there. Today, though, I was really suffering with a headache, a fever, and the weather, so I told the foreman I was going home. He took one look at me and told me to get the heck out of there before I got pneumonia. I was only too glad to comply, and within a few minutes, I was in my old truck and heading home. I thought about calling my wife on my cell phone but it seemed like such an effort in the condition I was in. Before I get too far into my tale, I should tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Ron Harding. Thirty-six years old, six feet tall, and weighing in about two hundred and twenty pounds. All right, I was a little heavy, but I liked my beer and relaxing when I wasn't working. I'm starting to lose my hair, too, but I wasn't in the running for anything new in my love life. So what the heck? The love of my life was now short for Nellie, my wife of sixteen years. We were in the same graduating class and married pretty much right out of high school. We started our married life living with my folks. They had a big old house with plenty of room, so it wasn't too bad. Nell and my mom got on well together, which made the living situation workable. My dad got me a job working with him as a carpenter, and that's where I picked up the trade. Nell now works part-time in a doctor's office three days a week, keeping track of medical records and insurance claims. She brings in a little extra money for the family. Nell is a nice-looking girl. Not glamorous, but nice-looking. She stands five feet four inches and weighs around 140 pounds. She carries a little extra weight like I do, but it looks good on her. After having two kids, she doesn't look bad at all. I know she can still get me aroused. We had our two kids early in our marriage. Brad is 15. And Angie is 13. They're good kids and average students, and we get along pretty well as a family. I tend to be the disciplinarian while Nell is the nurturer. That's the way it should be, I guess. Anyway, I was on my way home early, and it was about 1.30 p.m. on a miserable day. I felt awful and all I wanted to do was get home, have a long hot shower, then take a hefty slug of NyQuil and a couple of aspirin and go to bed. This was Nell's day off, so I could expect a little tender care from her, even though I didn't want to give her whatever I had. Arriving home, I pulled into the garage and noted our car was gone but assumed Nell had gone shopping or something. After closing the garage door, I stumbled into the house and headed upstairs to our bedroom, and the master shower. I was really looking forward to having that hot water pour over my miserable body. Entering the bedroom, I noticed that the bed was unmade, and thought it was odd because Nell always kept a very neat house, and she always had a fit if things were out of place or not neat. I started to strip off my clothes and throw them on the floor when I noticed wet spots on the bottom sheet of the bed left exposed by the thrown-back top sheet and comforter. I reached down with my finger and tentatively touched it. It was wet and felt slimy. I brought my finger to my nose and was shocked at the smell of a female and also a man's seed. Crap, I thought, she's cheating on me. This sure wasn't mine as we hadn't had sex for a couple of days. Heck, I thought some more. We hadn't had sex in over a week. I'd been too tired after getting home from working overtime, and just ate and crashed into bed. I was in a quandary, but with the fever and headache, my brain couldn't function, so I decided to get my shower and medications and sleep till I could handle this new situation. Damn, I was upset and getting madder by the minute as I stepped into the shower and let the hot water warm my cold body. That was the only thing that felt good because the rest of me was in turmoil. After drying myself off and getting into my PJs, I took a couple of aspirin and a slug of Nequil. 
Then I began to move my personal stuff out of our bedroom down the hall to our guest room. As I was finishing that up, I heard the door to the garage go up, and I knew she was getting home, and the crap was about to hit the fan. There were voices in the kitchen now, and I realized she had someone with her, then steps hurrying upstairs. Oh, you're home, she said as she appeared, pale and shaken, as she looked at me carrying some clothes down the hall. I had to go to school in a rush as the school called that Brad was sick. Are you feeling all right? No, I'm sick too, and I'm going to bed, I told her as I continued down the hallway. What's going on? Aren't you sleeping in our bed? No, I don't want to give the flu to you, and I know you don't want to give it to your lover. The shock on her face was immediate. What do you mean? Just go in and look at the bed and tell me that isn't what I think it is on the sheet. Oh no, oh God, I didn't want you to find it. But I had to rush to school. What are you going to do? She asked as she sagged against the wall, her face full of tears and anguish. I'm not going to do anything until I can get through this thing I've caught, but you'd better be ready for an explanation and a reason when I feel up to handling it. I told her as I continued into the guest room. Where are you going? I'm going into my room. I'll never sleep in that bed again. You can save it for your lover, and you'd better be prepared to give me his name too. Oh, please, honey, don't. Don't call me honey. As far as I'm concerned, you've broken our wedding vows, and we don't have a marriage anymore. I'll be sleeping in here until I can figure out what to do. Oh God, oh God, was all I heard as I shut the door and climbed into the guest bed. The next thing I knew was when I woke and found myself in darkness. My hand went over to the side of the bed where Nell usually slept and found it vacant. Then I slowly realized where I was and began to remember why. Cursing softly to myself, I sat up. I realized I was hungry, found my robe, and then quietly slipped downstairs to the kitchen. Turning on the light, I noticed by the clock that it was a little after 2 a.m. I found some leftovers in the fridge, and after heating them in the microwave, sat down to eat. Suddenly, I realized I was feeling better, allowing me to think about my marriage. A noise at the door caused me to look up and end my thoughts. Nell was standing there in her night robe, looking at me. I heard you come down. Are you feeling well enough to talk now? She asked. Her eyes were red as though she'd been crying. Yes, we can talk. Are you ready to tell me about it? I'll try. I think I know who it is, but why don't you confirm it? I don't think I can tell you that. Then there isn't anything to talk about, is there? I'll move out right away. Please, Ron. It's John. I suppose you mean Dr. John Clements. Yes. How long has it been going on? About six weeks. Do you love him? I don't know. You don't know. And you were screwing him in our bed, the bed we conceived our children in and I thought where we made love. But then, maybe they aren't my children. I had to give her some hurt. Oh God no, Ron. Don't think that. Is it over? I don't know. You don't know. I roared. Please run, keep your voice down. You'll wake the children. No, I don't know. Then you want a divorce. No, I still love you. And he's married with three kids the age of ours. He's in the same situation I'm in. He can't leave his family, but needs my love like you do. Do you think I'm going to remain a cuck while you're off servicing another man? Ron, I think you should know that I talked with a lawyer yesterday afternoon after you went to bed, and he told me that a divorce would end up being terribly expensive for you in this state. Not only would you have to pay for the divorce itself, but you would also have to pay me alimony and child support. You would also lose custody of the children. I think it would be better if you let me continue my meetings with John until we eventually end our association. She sat there primly and calm now that she had stated her position. I stared at her in disbelief, and with mounting rage. Through gritted teeth, I asked her, Do you really think that I will sit back 
and let you continue drilling your lover and cucking me, while I work myself to death trying to support you in this lifestyle. Is this going to be your response and position on this? I'm sure when you sit down and think about it, you will see that you may not have many other options, and yes, I believe that is my position, she replied calmly. My rage was almost a physical thing as I responded. Okay then, tomorrow I will contact a lawyer and see what I can get in the way of a second opinion regarding my options. Give it some more thought and I will give you my response tomorrow night. Is that satisfactory? I want you to know that I still love you and hope you will let me have this fling because that's all it is, a fling. When it's over, I will be back in a few weeks ready to be your wife again. Let me make this clear, I told her. I will never accept this in any way, shape, or form. Finally, how do you expect me to take you back after you're done screwing him and still be able to trust you that you'll never do it again? You have broken the marriage contract we made before God on a whim, and you expect me to believe you'll never do it again. I don't think so. I was hoping we could handle this in an adult, rational way, but I see you want to be stubborn about it. Well, you go see your lawyer tomorrow, and see what he says, and hopefully, you'll come to your senses. I'm going to bed now. Just remember this now. We've been married sixteen years, and you should know me pretty well. Do you really think I will accept your position? Good night. She left without responding, leaving me there where I sat thinking about my situation. By 4 a.m., I had pretty well figured out what I would do. It would just take talking with the lawyer and my parents that day to bring it about. I went back to bed filled with a grim determination. The next morning, I awoke about 9 a.m. and proceeded to put my ideas into effect. The kids had gone to school and Nell to work by that time. The first order of business was to make an appointment with a divorce lawyer, which I set up for that afternoon. After eating breakfast, I went over to see my parents and had a long talk with them. They were appalled at what Nell was doing but agreed that what I was proposing was the only way to respond to her and agreed to support me. Next, I went to Nell's parents and made them aware of what was going on in our marriage. They were shocked and couldn't understand their daughter's actions and how it affected our family. After I left them, I called our insurance agent and our family lawyer and made changes to my policy and my will. I then called my boss and talked with him for a while before going down to the bank. It was a very busy day, and it was late afternoon when I finished with a final phone call. I was now ready to meet with Nell and give her my response. While I waited for the kids to get home from school, I began to move stuff to my old truck. When Brad and Angie got home from school, I took them into the den and we sat down for a talk. I figured they were old enough and told them what their mother was doing. They were both shocked and mortified at her actions. I explained to them what was going to happen, and I knew it hurt them deeply, but they understood. I assured them that whatever happened, they would be looked after and then I drove them over to my parents before Nell got home. Nell arrived home at her usual time, and when she came in the door to the kitchen, I was sitting at the table waiting for her. Didn't you go to work today? she asked. No, I had some things to do, I replied. She just shrugged her shoulders and removed her coat. After hanging it up, she came to stand in front of me. Where are the kids? she asked. They're over at my folks. Have you given any thought about what we discussed last night? She asked. Yes, I've given it quite a bit of thought, and I met with a divorce lawyer today who confirmed what you've told me about my responsibilities in the event of a divorce. So, then it's settled. You will let me have my little fling, and we can go on with our lives. No, you remember I told you I would not agree to sitting around here or supporting you while I'm being cucked. So, I've come up with other plans. What are they? She asked with a perplexed look on her face. I'm not going to divorce you. She immediately smiled. Then how are you going to avoid being cucked? Well, I might be being cucked, but I don't think it will be with John. 
I called his wife today and told her what was going on. I don't think you're going to have a job tomorrow. Oh crap, you didn't, she gasped. I've also quit my job and am now unemployed. Her eyes almost bugged out of her head. Are you crazy? What are we going to live on? I think you should be asking yourself that question. What are you going to live on? What do you mean? I'm leaving you. I'm not divorcing you. If you want a divorce, you can get one and pay for it yourself. You can use abandonment as the cause. What about the kids? My parents have agreed to look after them if you're unable to support them. You may have to sign over custody to them, so they can get them covered by health insurance. I've already talked to them. And they, your parents, and mine know about your little fling and what you selfishly proposed. I don't think you are too popular right now with any of them. How could you do that? I'll get a lawyer and get the courts after you if you abandon me. And the kids. She added the last as an afterthought. You can do whatever you want. I'm going to be a long way from here, and you might hire someone to try to locate me. I don't think you're going to have the money to do that. And even if you found me, there is no way a court can force me to work if I don't want to. So, you are now responsible for making the mortgage payments, the car payments, and the payments on the new furniture you had to have. I've taken half the money I was saving to go to Florida, and I'm leaving you with my last paid check, which will be automatically deposited into our checking account. I've also changed my will and insurance policies to make the kids beneficiaries of any proceeds from them. You will get nothing from either of them. When you go to sell this house, you will find that paying off the mortgage and closing costs will eat up most of the equity we have in it. You are a jerk. You are a selfish individual. You didn't know when you had it so good. You just wanted more. Standing up, I headed for the door. Have a good life, Nell. Walking out to my truck, which I had loaded up with my personal things and my tools, I backed out of the garage and drove away. That day I drove all night to put as much distance between me and her as I could. I drove all night long until I was so tired, I couldn't drive anymore. My direction was south to the Gulf Coast, where construction work abounded, and I could lose myself in the anonymous life of an itinerant carpenter. I found others there in the same boat as I, constantly moving to avoid discovery by lost wives, lives, and families. My parents kept me informed about what had transpired after I left. Of course, Nell lost her job at the doctor's office, and his wife took him to the cleaners in a well-advertised divorce. He and Nell were never an item after that. Nell found work as a cashier at a supermarket, but lost the house, the car, and all the furniture. She ended up in a cheap apartment, with no chance of finding another husband to support her since she couldn't afford to divorce me. The kids ended up living with my folks, and they raised them. I sent money home to care for them, and enough to start a savings fund for their college education. I also sent them cards and money at Christmas, and for their birthdays, and kept in touch by phone. Seven years after leaving, I traveled back home, and was briefly reunited with my kids. Nell had never recovered their love and affection after I left, and they'd bonded with my folks. They turned out to be responsible people who had learned a lot about trust and loyalty in their upbringing. While I was back home, I went down to the store where Nell was still working as a cashier and took some items through her line. When she looked up and saw me, her shocked face turned ashen. When I asked her, Are you having a good life, Nell? She fainted. I left without looking back. I never saw her again. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.